If you have your sermon outline that is there, notice the review and the context. For especially those of you that are new to us this morning, this will be very helpful for you as we fly through it very quickly. The first thing is, underneath number one there is, this is the first letter written to the earliest churches of the New Testament. So there's several letters in your New Testament that were sent out, some to individuals, some to churches. Well, this is the first letter that went out from Jerusalem. So this is a very important look at the early church. In fact, this, church, this letter was probably written about 15 years after Jesus died on the cross after he died on the cross and then rose again and ascended back to the Father, commissioned the disciples to go and tell the world the Savior has died. So they've done that. Synagogues are becoming churches. Jewish people, first and foremost, they're coming to Christ first. I mean, that, that's what we see. The gospel goes to the Jew first and then to the rest of the world. That's just the way God chose to do it. He had a plan in the whole process of things. And so here we see the gospel has gone out. A lot of Jewish people have become Christians. And so there's, there's churches all around the Mediterranean world. And what is modern-day Greece? What is modern-day Turkey? All the way down across North Africa and Libya and Tunisia and Algeria, modern-day Algeria. Marcy and I lived in North Africa. We saw many, many baptistries that were actually built just a few years after this was written. So the church had spread. Pastor James, though half-brother of the Lord Jesus, was very concerned about some things in the early church. Notice number two. The letter of James gives several tests, fill that in, gives several tests to help you determine if you're a true Christian. Because what he saw was there was a lot of people who thought they had come to this, this gospel of the Messiah, this Lord Jesus Christ, but he saw that actually there was even enough of a movement that they were just kind of being swept along and they did not really know what it means to come to the Messiah. They did not really know what it means to become a follower of Jesus. And so this letter has two primary functions. This is number three. The first one is it's revealing what kind of faith? We said this last week. Faulty faith. It's, it's that some people were still bringing their Judaism and all of their religiosity into their quote-unquote Christian faith. And so they were really still de depending upon their own works. They were depending upon their own merits, not the merits of Christ. That song that we just sang, it doesn't just say, I put my faith in you, Jesus, that would be a very popular song. Augusta Top Lady wrote this song 150 years ago. And when he wrote this, he was very, very careful about the way he wrote those verses. That, that I put my faith in your blood. Um, I put my faith in the fact that you died for me. I didn't put my faith in your good moralistic teachings. I put my faith in the fact that you died in my place and you are my only hope. You see, this is the true gospel of Christ. This is what James is concerned about. James is concerned that people have come into churches or their synagogue kinda got switched over to a church if enough people believed in Christ, and they were still acting like Jews instead of acting like Jewish Christians. That they had not yet understood that Messiah was there. So he's seeking to expose false Christianity or fake Christians. The second thing that he's doing here is that as he does that, he's also teaching godly wisdom or the way of life for true Christians. So we see that in the rebukes and we see that in certain instructions throughout the book of James. And you go back and you can read them. He deals with partiality. He deals with um, wisdom, he deals with suffering, he deals with what you say with your tongue, he deals with whether or not you do what you say you believe. So he's really meddling with us. Now, in this next section that we, that we started last week, actually, is James chapter 4, and it's verse 13 through chapter 5, verse 12. And by the way, we have moved to chapter um, 5 this morning, so we come to that. But last week, we looked at 4, verse 13 through the end of the, uh, the, end of the chapter, and we saw the arrogant presumption 
of the sins of the wealthy, and you can kind of fill that in. This is about the sins of the wealthy. This whole section is that James is aiming at many folks in the life of the church that were perhaps somewhat wealthy in whatever town that they lived in, and that they had really profited upon the poor. Notice here with me, they, they make plans in their arrogant presumption. We looked at that last week. Um, and what we see today is they're robbing the poor. And, and James, Pastor James is saying, you can't rob the poor and be a Christian. You can't do that. You can't shut your heart out from those that are around you and expect that that's godly. That is, not the, that is not the behavior of a child of God. And then what we'll see next week is their need for patience in suffering because sometimes, you know, wealthy folks just kind of have what they, what, what they want. They just, they just kind of get it pretty quick and, it, and it's because they have influence and it's because they're not made to suffer very much. And, and we see that there can be a, a, a trend and a tendency to be rather impatient in this. And he's saying that, that these things, you, you cannot run in these things of presuming upon God, stepping upon others, and expecting everything what you want, when you want it. That is not the way it works as a child of God in a fallen world. Number five is, we, we said this last week, and it's important to repeat here, and help me out here. That said, anyone and who? Everyone can have these sinful mindsets. It's not just wealthy people. You see, I could say this. In some ways, every single one in this room, by the nature of the fact that you live in America, you are what? You are rich you are wealthy. If we were to take all the Christians of the world and put them in one big auditorium, and we take the Christians from America and put them all in one area, they would look quite different than the Christians of the rest of the world. And part of the reason is we are wealthy. We have much. Now, I, I, there's, I'm going to make some statements here in just a moment. There's not going to be anything on the screen, or there's not going to be much coming up on the screen, because there's several statements that have to be made about this as we deal with this issue of wealth. But we just need to look at number five. We just need to recognize that anyone and everyone can have this problem. You see, there's some of you who would say, Wait, are you talk what are you talking about? I live in a one-bedroom apartment. I live on Social Security. I'm sorry, but I'm not one of the wealthy. And I, I understand that symptom. I mean, I see people around me here in South Florida. I see all of these things. How in the world can you say I'm one of the wealthy? Well, I, I understand. And there's a relative nature to this. There's no doubt about it. But we would be in great danger of writing this off if we were to say, I, I'm just not one of the wealthy. This really doesn't apply to me. Wrong. Be very, very careful about that. In fact, we say this under number five. Notice this. Don't excuse yourself from the rebuke and instruction of God's word. This is a dangerous thing to do. We need to submit ourselves as we see um, calls for faith, as we see calls for obedience in every area of Scripture. Now, look at number six. Last week, we saw the common but serious sin, the common but serious sin of leaving God out of our plans and decisions. That's the first thing that James brings up about the wealthy. He says, you, you kind of make all your plans. You're going to go into this city. You're going to make a profit. And you say, we're going to live there for a year. We're going to make a profit. We're going to do our thing. And you, you don't even consider what does God want you to do. You're just, you're looking at the next thing you can do. And James is coming hard against that to these Christians that are spread around in the modern world, or at least people who are claiming to be Christians spread around. He's saying, do you have an attitude of submission to God? Do you submit to God's will, or are you just going to do what you're going to do? You see, there's a, there's a very, very clear call that James says here, is that instead, look at verse 15 there underneath number six, instead you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will do this or that. 
You see, true Christians, fill it in, true Christians will live very aware of God's sovereignty over all things and make their plans and decisions in humble, glad, circle the word, active, active submission to what? To God's will, to his will. This is what true Christians do. Um, And this morning, the challenge is just as real for us in this place as it would be for those in that day and time. Now, as we, as we are about to launch into this, I want to make a few statements about this, and I've written them down, so just really listen. I, I pray that the Holy Spirit will give you um, the ability to, to really take in some of these things and think through this, um, both theologically and philosophically for us. As I was preparing this message, I just thought, when we use the word rich, who are some names that we often think of? Okay, I heard it. Bill Gates, Warren Buffett, Mark Zuckerberg. Yeah, I mean, we, we, we just start we, start, we start with these high power, high profile billionaires. That, that's what we often think of with the rich. Well, again, I've already started to stretch our meaning of the rich when I say that here we are in America, we're, we're the rich in comparison to the rest of the world. So there's a, a, uh, there's a massive stretch that is there. But think about this. It's very interesting that James zones in on this and identifies the rich. And look at the top of the page there. It just says, come now, you rich. So he's, he's dealing with that. And he's, and he's calling them out. But just kind of listen to this. Um, it, to me, it's interesting that he does this, and it's, it's like many people esteem the rich, and they want to be rich, if even subtly or secretly or maybe even subconsciously. But it's often popular to bash the rich and to condemn the rich and to want to take from the rich. And it's interesting that we often want to take from the rich, but, but you don't really have that capability unless you get a whole government behind you and unless there's often a revolution. And that's exactly what happens very often is if you look through history, you look at Greek civilization, you look at Roman civilization and the fall of the Roman Empire. And through practically every major civilization, an epic, and even country and nation, the economy is very often the issue. Not always, sometimes it's strictly an ideology, but very often it's the economy. Um, it's the economy who? Stupid, right? I mean, you remember that from the uh, election, several elections, presidential elections ago. Um, you know, we, we, we were saying it's the economy. Well, we, we see the economic forces of rich and poor playing into many dynamics that happen in our life. So it makes sense that it shows up in James. It makes sense that it shows up when our earthly lives are really being affected by this. It's interesting that from one empire or country to another to one inside a country or an empire, there's often wars between either nations or wars that are civil wars over economic disparity or over great differences in wealth. In fact, some of the great literature from the 19th century is set in the French Revolution um, with the notorious conflict between the French aristocracy, the bourgeois, and the proletariat. Think about some of those great works of literature, Les Miserables, um, A Tale of Two Cities, um, The Scarlet Pimpernel. I don't know if you've ever seen the movie, The Scarlet Pimpernel. It's worth renting. It, it, it's, a, it's a great, good story, clean story, uh, The Scarlet Pimpernel. Um, but here we see the French Revolution in all of, its, all of its angst and all of its brutality. And much of it had to do with the rich oppressing the poor. And that story is, is, is repeated throughout the civilizations, throughout the centuries, in fact, throughout the millennia. Our current political struggles are full of hypocrisy on this. 
Politicians love to bash the rich. We see that a lot. Um, very often they um, themselves are rich or they will soon be rich um, as soon as they leave office. Have you figured that out? That pol politics is quite a business. I don't know if you've figured that out yet or not. Write the book, make the millions, or have influence or be on boards. That winds up your, your public service winds up being um, a massive golden parachute. Um, this passage is not about popular caricatures of the wealthy. It's not about the world's conflict between the rich and the poor. This passage, listen, this passage is not a diatribe against rich people as if the evil is inherent in the wealth itself. That is not what this passage is about. While it is true that Jesus made clear that many wealthy people will not come to know God in faith, he, Jesus said it's easier for what? A camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to gain eternal life, whether he's talking about a specific gate leading into Jerusalem that was, that was a high security gate for evening use and it was hard to get cam camels through it, or whether he was talking about in a, in a hyperbole way, just making a, a statement saying that it, it's very, very hard for a rich man to depend upon God, to look to God, and not to himself, and to gain eternal life. But, but think about this with me. Both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, there were many wealthy people. In fact, some of the godly and most prominent people were, in fact, wealthy. Some of them were very poor, notoriously poor. But think about these names that were wealthy from the Old Testament. Abraham. Abraham was exceedingly wealthy, and yet he was the father of faith. Here he was a man that had faith in God. Isaac was exceedingly wealthy. Jacob, exceedingly wealthy. David, exceedingly wealthy. How about Solomon? Solomon, wise and wealthy. Jehoshaphat, very wealthy. Hezekiah, very wealthy. Now we come to the New Testament, and just, just think about a couple of them. Jesus' death, who is prominent in Jesus' death when he's being taken off the cross? Joseph of Arimathea, a very wealthy man. And Christian tradition tells us that Joseph became an influential partner, an influential leader in the early church. How about in Paul's day, as the churches were spreading, a Jewish man named Aquila who was run out of Rome because he was Jewish, when the Romans were persecuting Jews, you know, the Jews have been persecuted from one millennia to the next. And, and here we see that Aquila is run out of, out of Rome, and he, he comes to the gospel, he hears the gospel, he and his wife Priscilla wind up getting to know Paul, and apparently they are, they are wealthy merchants. In fact, they're wealthy enough that they have quite a home, and there's quite a church. That, that meets in their home. That's one of the ways you know that Priscilla and Aquila, or Aquila and Priscilla, were a wealthy couple. Their, church, their home was large enough that church could really meet there. Um, so we're, we're not saying that ri all rich people are evil and going to hell. But what this passage is talking about, as we'll read it again, is very specific about it. This passage is about a common tendency that the wealthy sometimes have, that they have gained their wealth by oppression and dishonest means against the lower classes, or they maintain their wealth by oppression and dishonest, uncompassionate means. Now, if you have your Bible, turn with me to Luke chapter 19. You, this, this is Luke chapter 19. This is one of the few times when I really have you turn there um, outside of your sh sermon outline. But I want you to see in Luke chapter 19 um, the story of Jesus coming into Jericho. And as he's coming into Jericho, <clears throat> in Luke 19, we see that he comes across a little short man. And who was the wee little short man? Zacchaeus was a what? Just a wee little man. A wee little man was he. That means he was small. I guess that song was originally written in Scotland. Um, but um, notice here with me, he was just a wee lad. 
And we, we see it in Luke chapter 19, verses 1 through 10. And we see this picture of salvation coming to a man with a bad reputation. Let me remind you that a tax collector was someone who basically had come along with the Romans. They, had, they were a Jewish person that had sided with the Romans, a publican, a Jewish man who sided with the Romans, and he collects taxes for the Romans. So he's, he's worse than a Roman to the Jewish people because he sided with them and he's used by them to get money out of them. And so they might be at a gate where they're collecting a toll. There may be um, actually similar to the, inner, the IRS where there's certain uh, markets where he comes around and he makes collection at certain markets where things are sold. And th th there would be multiple ways in which they would tax the people. And here in in Luke chapter 19, we see an example of one who would come to faith after abusing his, his stature and, and becoming wealthy, in fact, at the oppression of a hurting and, a, and poor people. Look at Luke chapter 19 and verse 1. And he entered Jericho, speaking of Jesus, he entered Jericho and was passing through, and there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a what? a chief tax collector, and was what? Rich. Look at verse 3. And he was seeking to see who Jesus was. So he didn't even know what Jesus looked like, and he wanted to see him. So in verse 3, he says, but on account of the crowd, he could not because he was small of stature. Verse 4, so he ran on ahead and climbed up in a sycamore tree to see him, for he was about to pass that way. And when Jesus came to that place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must say, stay at your house today. Verse 6. So he hurried and came down and received him how? Joyfully. Verse 7. And when they saw it, they all grumbled. He has gone to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. Verse 8, and Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. No 10% here. The half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it what? Fourfold. And Jesus said to him, this is so interesting, and Jesus said to him, salvation has come to this house since he also is a son of Abraham, for the son of man came to seek and to save the lost. Now there's several things going on in the story. It's Jesus going to, to Jericho and one looking and, and trying to see Jesus, and then Jesus siding with this one that everyone else is rejecting, they don't even think of themselves as sinners. They, look, they say, look, he's going to hang out with a sinner. And then we see a man, as he hears the message of Jesus, we would assume, as he is with Jesus, the, there, there's the, the presence of Christ that is, that is coming into his life, coming into his home, and what does he do? There's evidence that he's a changed man. There's, there's evidence that some, I mean, not just anybody gives away half of what they've got on the spot. Not just anyone says, I've cheated people. Everybody knows that. And I'm going to give back fourfold what I've taken. I mean, who does that? You have courts that go after that and seek to make that happen. But you see, there, there's, it's very interesting that Jesus says in verse 9, look what it says, today salvation has come to this house since he also is the son of Abraham. It, it's, it's that salvation came that day to Zacchaeus. I want to say to you that there's a day of salvation that needs to be in your life. There's a point of conversion. Jesus was very specific and how he said it, 
Today salvation has come to this house. My question is, has salvation come to your house? And it, and, and it may be the way you view money. It may be the way you view the poor. It may, it, James is saying, let me reveal whether or not you know God based upon how your heart is toward wealth and how your heart is toward the poor. This is what defines a Christian in part. It's, it's not removed from it. You say, well, it's only believe in Jesus. Just only believe in Jesus. Believe that he was Messiah. That is the picture. I would say, absolutely. There's nothing that we can add to the blood of Christ. We've just sung about it. But the picture is, true Christians, it, it is revealed. It, it is seen that their lives are changed. That they are converted from this world's economy to the economy of God. And so I, I think that there's a lot that can be seen from this glorious passage. There's a lot that can be seen from, from this. In fact, in 1 Timothy chapter 6, we see another example. You can just write off there to the side. 1 Timothy chapter 6, 17 through 19. Um, it, it's so powerful. In Timothy's church, Paul writes to Timothy, and li listen to these words. In verse 17, he says, As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. In verse 18, he says, They, they are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. I mean, a glorious passage that helps us see this stark contrast. And, and the, the idea is, is that there were rich in the church, even in Timothy's day, maybe a couple of decades after this. And so we, we see that, that this isn't just merely to some group of people over there that we don't have anything to do with. This is toward us. And so this morning, as we, as we just look at this very powerful passage, I, I want you to see it with me and um, notice here with me in the text, um, James chapter 1 and verse 1 through 6. I, I, I just want to read it again and let you see what God is saying to us through his word as he calls us to recognize that he indeed and he only is um, the one who can forgive our sin and heal what we have. Notice here with me in verse 1. It says, come now, you rich, weep and howl for the, mystery, for the miseries. Can you circle those two words, weep and howl? This is amazing language. He says, come now, you rich, weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches have rotted and your garments are moth-eaten. Verse 3, your gold and silver have corroded and their corrosion will be evidence against you and will eat your flesh like circle it, fire. You have laid up treasure in the last days. We are in the last days. The idea here is the time between Christ and the first coming and the time between his second coming. These are, it's a long last days, but these are the last days. This is the last epic before Christ comes again and everything changes. So we're in the last days. He says, you have laid up treasure in the last days. Not in heaven, but in the last days here on earth. Look at verse four. Behold, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields which you kept back by fraud, are crying out against you. And the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. You have lived on the earth in luxury and in self-indulgence. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the righteous person. He does not resist you. And by the way, that phrase, he does not resist you, you say, why doesn't he resist him? Because he's a righteous person. And part of the righteous person here we see is he's saying, you know what? I've come and I've worked hard and you're not going to pay me. And, you know, that may be wrong, but God is going to deal with you. 
I, I, I'm not going to come and burn your house down at night. I'm not going to come and, and do this and do that. God will deal with you. You see, the, 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 the poor may not have the ability to even get to the house because there's guards. The poor may not have the ability to even strike back, but, but he doesn't even resist you. In part, many would say, because he's a righteous person and he knows that God is the great leveler in the grand scheme of things. So let's look at just four things real quick as we see this passage. The non-seeker-friendly indictment of the unrighteous rich. This is, you know, just not very seeker-friendly. Notice what it says here. Notice the prophetic language that declares judgment. This is prophetic language. This is like from the prophets. This is like from the Old Testament. And this, these, are, these are extreme words. This is declaring a prophecy. It's like Isaiah chapter 13. You can just look up on the screen in front of you. And look at Isaiah chapter 13, verses 4 through 8 say, the sound of a tumult is on the mountains. That's a, that's a great happening, like an, like an earthquake. As of a great multitude, or a great multitude running after in war. Look at the middle of verse 4. The sound of an uproar of kingdoms, of nations gathering together. The Lord of hosts is mustering a host for battle. They come from a distant land, from the ends of the heavens. And the Lord, the weapons of his indignation to destroy the whole land. Look at verse 6. Wail. For the day of the Lord is near, a destruction from the Almighty, it will come. Therefore, all hands will be feeble, and every human heart will what? Melt. They will be dismayed. Pangs and agony will seize them, and they will be in anguish like a woman in labor. They will look aghast at one another. Their faces will be aflame. There, this is terror. This is a holy terror that is coming upon the ungodly. Look at Isaiah chapter 15 and verse 3, the agony of Moab. We see this. In the streets they wear sackcloth. I mean, they, they, they've come down to where they have nothing, and they're wearing sacks. On the housetops and in the squares, everyone what? Wails and melts in tears. Friends, you, you may say, well, I, I prefer Philippians, you know, chapter 4. I, you know, I like John 3, 16. I, I, I you know, wh why do we have to look at that? Listen, every word of God's word is for us to come and to save us that we may know who he is, that we may know him not just in his benevolence, but listen, in his wrath, because his benevolence means nothing if you don't understand his wrath. As we, we, we need a, a healthy view of the real God of Scripture, and that's what James is aiming at. James is saying Look, friends, this God that you say that you believe, he's serious. He means what he said in the Old Testament. And that's what James is doing. James is sounding like an Old Testament book, warning you. Warning you, sifting you, calling you to really evaluate your heart, to really evaluate your faith, to let him come and convict you and drive you to his grace. Look at Hosea chapter 7 and verse 14. You know the story of Hosea and Gomer and this picture that God's people keep running away from him, running away from him, running away from him, and God comes and he chastises, but then he calls back. Look at chapter 7 and verse 13. He says, Woe to them, for they have strayed from me, destruction to them, for they have rebelled against me. I would redeem them, but they speak lies. Not just that they speak lies, but they speak lies what? Against me. This is like your child lying to others about you, against you. You say, how much would that hurt? How much would it hurt if Andrea and, and Cheryl Ann were saying, horrible things about me and Marcy that were not true. How much would that hurt me? 
And here we see that that's what God's people do when they stray away from him and when they go after other gods and when they even come around in their apostasy to mock him. Look at verse 14. They do not cry to me from the heart, but they wail upon their beds. So they're in agony and they're hurting, but they don't cry out to me. For grain and wine they gnash themselves. They rebel against me, verse 15. Although I trained and strengthened their arms, yet they devise evil against me. You see, this is the human condition in a fallen world that we, we reject God in ways that we don't even understand and we don't even know what to do to get back to him. Very often in Hosea, in the picture of Hosea, we see this great, great pain and this great wailing. Look at Amos chapter 8. Amos chapter 8, this is what the Lord showed me, Amos writing, behold, a basket of summer fruit, verse 2, and he said, Amos, what do you see? I said, a basket of summer fruit. Then the Lord said to me, the end has come upon my people, Israel. I will never again pass by them, verse 3. The songs of the temple shall become what? wailings in that day, declares the Lord God. So many dead bodies, they are thrown everywhere. Silence. Verse 4, hear this, you who trample on the needy and bring the poor of the land to an end. You see, their sin that is mentioned in this rebellion is their mistreatment of the poor their mistreatment of the oppressed. Here we see in the passage of James and we see in the side passage of Amos that the poor are important to God. And part of it is all this grand, grand thing of this, this earthly life is a test. It's a test for the poor of what they are going to do with their state of being in poverty. And listen to this. It's a test of the rich of what they are going to do with their state of wealth. Our life is a stewardship, whether poor or wealthy. We, we can honor God from both positions. The question is, will we? Will we live for this moment in despair as a poor person, or will we live in this moment of wealth and independence from God? Here, James is saying Christians live compassionate toward the poor and and in dependence upon God. Now, there's, there's great statement of wrath in this, and, and I, I want you to just look up there at the passage again at the top of the page. I want you to see this. He says, come now, you rich, weep and howl for the miseries um, that are upon you. Your riches have rotted, your garments are moth-eaten, your gold and silver have corroded, their corrosion will be evidence against you, and your flesh will, and will eat your flesh like fire. Now, I want, you to, I want you to just see a few things that are here. Number two, um, I, I want you to see this, this great judgment that comes upon them. Your temporary wealth fades away, and it still testifies against you. That's what we see in verse two and three. Fill it in, just the bullet points that are there. Your riches they have rotted. <coughs> Your fine clothing, they have what? Been eaten by moth. Now, that second one is kind of a weird one if you're under 50 years of age in this room. Would you agree? Uh, how many of you have ever had a moth ruin a piece of clothing? Would you lift your hand? Okay, it's mainly a little bit of the older crowd because here in America, we got nice tight houses now. We got all these insecticides. We have these various things. And young people usually don't know what that problem was like a few decades ago. A few decades ago, especially when there wasn't air conditioning and things were a little bit different, a little bit more, moths would get into your clothes and they'd just go eating through your clothes. And, I mean, th- th- that's, that's part of what they do. 
And, and here, it, James is using this picture. He's saying, look, your, your precious metals are going to corrode. Your, your riches are going to rot. The wood is going to rot. The fruits and the vegetables are going to rot. All of this abundance that you have is going to rot. And the precious metals have corrupted or corroded. Now, um, some of you would say, well, gold doesn't really react. Gold is always shiny. In fact, in the pictures of Titanic last week, we saw the gold clock, and there it was on the bottom of the ocean for 100 years, and it's still shiny. Well, that, that's generally true, but did you know that gold actually can corrode? Gold not only can become tarnished, much like silver, but in fact, there are certain chemicals that dissolve gold. In fact, there are certain jewelers that, that they sometimes get in trouble because somebody brings in a, a piece of jewelry that they think is great, and the jeweler goes to clear it, clean it, and the thing disappears in the jar because it wasn't really gold, or it was gold-plated. Um, we, we see that, that there's a corrosion that occurs even with the wealth of the things that seem so very reliable. And that corrosion actually testifies against you. It's your wealth that you gained in the hurt of others. And so there is a massive statement of condemnation. Now, I want you to see a quote here from Thomas Guthrie. This guy was a pastor in Scotland in 1803 to 1873 was his life. But notice this, and, and especially toward the end of this quote, I want you to notice the end of this quote. But he says, does man ask, why am I born with a bias to sin? So he's dealing with this question of, why am I held accountable for sin? Why has another's hand been permitted to sow germs of evil in me? Talking about Adam's sin, or even all the way down to my parents' sin. Why am I held accountable for other sin? Why am I born in sin? Why should I who was no party to the first covenant, the Adamic covenant of, between God and, and Adam, that, where Adam sins, why am I no party to that covenant? Why am I being buried in its ruins? To these questions, this is my reply. I shrink from sitting in ju judgment upon my judge. Clouds and darkness are round about Jehovah now. He's saying, I can't see him clearly. I don't understand exactly what he's doing. But I feel confident that when the veil of this present circumstance, this present state, shall be torn, an expiring time, echoing the cry of the cross, exclaims, it is finished. It shall be seen that righteousness and judgment are the pillars of Jehovah's throne. Notice those two things. Righteousness and judgment are the pillars of God's throne, is what Guthrie would say. But although the permission of sin is a mystery, the fact of its punishment is no mystery at all. And while every answer to the question, how did God allow sin, leaves us unsatisfied, to my mind, nothing is plainer than this, that whatever was his reason for permitting it to exist, he could not permit it to exist unpunished. So, so here, I mean, we're just seeing the judgment of God is a very, very real, real doctrine over sin. And James is saying it clear. God is not a God to be trifled with. He calls us to be running to his grace, to be running to who he is. I want you to see as we, as we just kind of wrap up here a couple more things very quickly. Number three, your cheating the poor invokes God's judgment and wrath. When a wealthy person takes advantage of a poor person, perhaps does not pay them as they should, takes advantage in a sale, takes advantage in a work relationship, this invokes God's judgment and his wrath. In fact, the language here is Lord of hosts. That's the commander of heaven's armies, as the ESV Bible makes clear. I, I love that, a good note. ESV Bible just kind of says, you're talking about the armies of heaven. 
are coming after those who, make, who come and take advantage of the poor. Look at Proverbs 11, verse 4 on your outline. Riches do not profit in the day of wrath, but righteousness delivers from death. Well, how do we get righteousness? We see that in this next part that is here. Look at number four with me. If you're going to be wealthy, you better be godly. If you're going to be wealthy, you better be godly. One of the things that we see here is don't set your heart on riches but on God. We see that from even last week when we looked at Luke chapter 12. Look at Luke chapter 12. Look at that passage that I've included on your outline there. In verse 19 he says, I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. Verse 20, but God said to this wealthy guy, God said to him, fool, this night your soul is required of you. And the things that you have prepared, whose will they be? Now look at verse 21, underline it. So is the one who lays up treasure for himself. Here it is. And is not rich toward God. Friends, this is, this is convicting to me in my own heart as I've been studying, as I've been looking at the book of James. I want to be careful that my heart is rich toward God and not toward this life. How about you? Set your heart on God. Make your heart by his grace rich toward him. Look at the next bullet point there. Do not close your heart to the poor, but be just and generous. We need to be just and generous if we are true Christians. Look at 1 John chapter 3, verse 17. But if anyone has this world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? That's what James is saying. James is saying, if you claim to be a Christian and you ignore the poor or you oppress the poor or you take advantage of the poor, how does God's love exist within you? You're not a Christian. You don't have eternal life. You're not saved. In fact, you're going to weep and howl at the miseries that are coming at you. And you're going to leave behind all the things that you've accumulated and you've amassed. Notice here with me in Proverbs 14, verse 3. I love this. This is so powerful. He who oppresses the poor does what? Taunts his maker. Underline that. Taunts his maker. You, you, are, you are just tempting God to come after you. Well, God's not tempted by evil. And he, he's not. No, but you're evil, and your heart is inviting God's wrath upon him. But he who is gracious to the needy honors him. The last thing I want you to see as part of, if you're going to be wealthy, you better be godly as this. Do not miss the work of God's kingdom. Do not miss the work of God's kingdom with your life and with your wealth. I believe that saved people are involved with God's kingdom. Now, don't put anything away yet. I'm really serious. There's two more things I want you to write down. First of all, look at Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. Let's all read it out loud together. Look at what it says, bottom of the page. Let's read. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Can you circle, seek first the kingdom of God? Just circle that. He's saying, you put God first. You put God's for, God first in values, in doctrines, in beliefs. Listen to this. He, here he's talking about earthly things, money. Don't put anything away yet. Out there to the side, look what it says. Do not miss the work of God, of God's kingdom. Put out there to the side. Put it first. This is what true Christians do. True Christians do not see their kingdom first. True Christian, Christians see 
the kingdom of God first. True Christians view the world through God's kingdom. So if you, if you want to know whether you're a Christian, part of the question is, do you, do you see God's kingdom as first? What does that, what does that mean? Well, it's, it's the kingdom of his love, and it's the kingdom of his truth, and it's the kingdom of his grace. It's the kingdom of Christ's people in the church. It, it's God's people on earth together. I, I want to say to you, as you, we build the kingdom of God and not our own, we are proving our faith in Jesus Christ. I can say to you that as growing up in this church, I've been so grateful for the heritage that we have at Sheridan Hills. There were many churches that became mega, mega, mega churches during the 70s and the 80s. In Sheridan Hills, though, you would say, well, this is a pretty big church and so forth. You know, we have a pretty big history. I would say yes. But you know what our church has done, always done? Has given very sacrificially to missions has given very sacrificially to missions both locally and globally. And even in this last year, in times of hardship and financial hardship, we have sent out over $100,000. Even in this time of of difficulty, we've sent 100 grand away that God, and you know what? I think that we could send 300 grand away if we would all give if we would all give sacrificially, if we would all put God's kingdom first, we we could increase that amazingly. And I want to challenge you. I want to challenge you to say, no, we want to plant churches where nobody's planted churches in the Middle East. We want to plant churches where nobody's planted churches in Central and East Asia. We want to fulfill Christ's call to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. We want our young people to become missionaries. We want our children to go and proclaim the gospel. We want to support them. We want to see God move. You see, that's what it means that if you're going to be wealthy, you better be godly. That means be on God's team, not just your team. And so, you, you, you know, you're sitting there looking, well, how can I get, I mean, good night, the 75-inch televisions have come down to such and such. Maybe we ought to get one of those. And maybe we, well, when is enough enough? There's always more in this world. I want to encourage you to move your sights off living after all of your own desires and as he says in James, your self-indulgence and live for the kingdom of God. This is what true Christians do. I want you to see these last two statements and you are safe to put this away, but, but just look at this. Two questions. Please, or two statements. Please do not hear this as a call to moralistic behavior. You don't need to say, oh, I better go out and act like a Christian. I I better go out and, and try to prove my salvation. Look at the next part. Please see that Pastor James is declaring God's judgment on people who have not been converted to Christ. That's the point of James chapter 5, verses 1 through 6. He's saying these people think that they're Christians, but they're not. And this sounds much like the book of Jude. Remember the little book of Jude that we studied? And it, it, where he's calling out the apostasy, and he's calling out the preachers of apostasy, and he's saying, you have no idea what is coming in your judgment. He's calling us to either see and evaluate our lives and say, I may not know Christ. Or he's calling us to say, I want to be very careful to honor Christ as my Savior and Lord with my life. And that's what we see James calling us to do. If you would, please stand where you are and look at the last verse. I want you to see this on the screen. And as you look at this, you know, we often talk about John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. But I want you to see John 3, 36, and I want you to read it out loud with me. Let's read it together. Whoever believes in the son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the son shall not see life 
but the wrath of God remains on him. Just look at that verse. If you believe, you have eternal life. But look at the next phrase. If you truly believe, you are going to obey. The question is, do you obey? Because that reveals whether or not you truly believe. If you believe, you have eternal life. You're forgiven. You're God's. You're his child. You're, his, you're in his kingdom. Your sins, past, present, and future, are covered by the blood of the Lord Jesus. And you are, are given the great joy of eternal life, knowing and seeing God for all of eternity. But if you do not believe, excuse me, if you do not obey, you see that you will not see life and the wrath of God remains on you. Sheridan Hills, may we be a church that carefully looks at our salvation, that carefully looks at God's word and runs to it in every way.